a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. Well, today we're going to discuss the experiences of 14 people who died and came back to life. And their recollections of these near-death encounters have been documented and compiled into a movie-length documentary that will be released soon in Australian cinemas. What makes these stories even more fascinating is that the 14 people are from different cultures and different parts of the world, and yet their stories are similar and have common themes. Dr. Michael Sabom, a cardiologist, author, and professor of medicine, is one of the researchers who interviewed the 14 people, and he gives a fascinating account of these near death experiences. Dr. Michael, I'd like to welcome you to 2020 today. Thank you. Well, Dr. Michael, you. <laughs> you're across Australia today live. Dr. Michael, obviously you're from a medical background, you know, you're educated, uh, you're experienced. What uh, caused you to want to interview these people about their near-death experiences? Well, I first was introduced to Raymond, Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, in 1975. And I was in my cardiology fellowship at the University of Florida at the time. And I was shown the book by a psychiatric social worker. And uh, I was very hesitant to even read it. Because on the front of the book, there was a smashed egg uh, with the yolk and the silhouette of a human being with life after life. And it claimed to uh, write about people who had uh, these experiences after death. So the word that I used at the time that I remember is hogwash. That's what I thought these experiences were. (laughs) So it took a lot of arm twisting by this uh, social worker. Uh, She was going to be presenting the book to a local church, and I told her I'd help her. And she said, well, that's great. Have you ever interviewed any of your patients that you resuscitated, uh, and did they have this experience? Uh, And my answer was absolutely not. And and I actually even went around to some of the older physicians in the hospital asking them if they had ever heard these things from their patients, and it, it, it was universally no. So anyway, she challenged me to start asking uh, a patient or two that that I had resuscitated uh, whether or not she had a near-death experience like Moody described in his book. And sure enough, the third patient I interviewed had an experience very close to what Moody had written about. So she also had patients in the hospital, asked her patients, and she found one too. So with these two patients and Moody's book, we presented the presentation at the church audience, and it was received very, very well. So after the talk, we got together. Her name is Sarah, uh, and I got together, and we decided to do a medical study on looking into these experiences because Moody's book was not written with any kind of medical uh, format or questioning or whatever. Uh, And that disturbed me a lot because that's what what I was all about at the time. So anyway, uh, we designed the study and began interviewing patients. And this went on for uh, two years. Uh, And then our way split. She went to uh, Louisiana where she got her Ph.D. in social work. And I went to Emory University in Atlanta as assistant professor of medicine. So we split and I continued to study. Uh, and at the end of it, we had, I had, uh, I think 116 patients. Uh, I had collected all the data on them, the background data, their, uh, their education, whether they knew anything about medicine or whatever. And they, they had had a, what we call a near, uh, near death experience. And these people were unconscious and physically near death. And since I'm a cardiologist, most of them had a cardiac arrest. And the, uh, what I found was that the experience fell into three different types. Uh, there was what, what I called the autoscopic uh, near-death experience. Autoscopic is a word that means self-visualization. And these are the people who float up out of their body and they're actually looking down on their body from the ceiling at what's going on in the room. The next type of experience was a transcendental experience, 
which Moody describes very, very well in this book as a travel down a tunnel, seeing a light, meeting deceased relatives and friends, told it's not their time to be there and that they must return. And then there's a com combined experience where the autoscopic occurs first, and then the transcendental follow follows it thereafter. The part of the experience that I found most interesting, because my background was not in this sort of a thing. thing. It was in uh, a so solid uh, scientific uh, data. Uh, and I was interested in if somebody floated up out of their body and said they could see, see what was going on. Uh, at the time, I knew they were unconscious because they were being resuscitated and shocked and everything else. Uh, I was very interested in knowing exactly how accurate what they said they saw uh, when it was compared to what actually had happened. Yeah, because you so wanted I, to actually obviously find some scientific evidence that what they're claiming to have seen actually existed. And I like where you're going with this because I've heard these stories myself. So so tell us what happened when you started investigating that. When I started investi investigating that, uh, they were telling me very accurate accounts. So I then looked into how did they get this these records or these accounts that turned out to be very accurate. And I'm not talking about a description like, yeah, I saw a bunch of nurses and doctors standing around the bed and they were all doing these certain things. And, and one, one moment I was out and the next moment I woke up and I was looking in her face. That sort of thing is a very general description. That could be a what flashback was, to general hospital, couldn't it? Yeah, that's so vague. Right, I mean, any, anyone could see that. Absolutely. But remember, this is 1970s. Okay. So it's not a flashback to general hospital. It's a flashback to nothing like that. That, that was not a general program at that time. Yep. And, and that's a very important point, actually, because none of these patients in this one select group that I put in one chapter, none of them were aware even that somebody else had had these experiences. And I dare say that if you go around talking to people now, you can't find anybody who, who has not at least heard about them. So anyway, these were very naive people, naive in the sense that they were not uh, aware of these experiences happening because of that they said very little about it because they thought they were had a dream hallucination or going crazy or whatever so anyway i i correlated the accuracy of the experience to what was going on at the time during the resuscitation and then i looked into whether there were any uh mundane explanations for what what they saw uh and i could find none uh one real question I had was, I think you already intimated it, is that their general knowledge of medicine would allow them to construe the experience in a sort of pseudo accurate manner. And I thought that that was probably what was going on if they were coming up with these stories. And so I did a control group study where I interviewed uh, very seasoned cardiac patients who had been in the hospital, uh, familiar with the equipment and everything else. And then I said, imagine that you're over in the corner of the room looking down on yourself being resuscitated. What do you think it would look like? Just describe to me what you were fairly sure you would see. And what I did was compare those those accounts to what the near-death experiencers were saying, and they were markedly different. The near-death experiencers were telling me very accurate accounts, whereas I think 80% of the other ones made major mistakes. So at least that gives some sort of uh, hint that this is just not general information they had that they were making into their own experience. Yeah, they were relating but specific details and facts and, and events and things happening, as you said, in that room where they're being resuscitated that really a person could not know unless they actually were watching it. Correct. And there were not only, uh, there were unique experiences too that happened. I remember one patient who, uh, he was actually an airline pilot, so he must have been interested in this sort of thing. We Back then on these resuscitating machines, they had little dials, two dials, and 
when you were charging the machine, one dial would go up to a certain level. That's the number of watt seconds or electricity that would be delivered. And the other dial would just go up when it was shocked. Uh, and you don't charge those things until you're ready to use them. And you're not ready to use them before you're real sure the patient is unconscious and in cardiac arrest. And so this guy watched the dials on, on the machine, told me how they uh, charged it, how the other dial came up and met the one where it had, they had set it at, and then they shocked it. And then he came back into his body. That that sort of thing is not something that you would even pick up on General Hospital if it happened to be shown. There. <laughs> Definitely so, anyway, not. Th those were the sort of unique things that I was I was looking for, uh, because I must say that I came at this thing as a very skeptical cardiologist. I, I didn't think this was really happening, so I really wanted to find out if there was some ex explanation for this that would fit with ordinary reality. Well, I love that about you, Dr. Michael, that you came into this um, study or experiment with a scientific background and a cynical mind. I think that's healthy because uh, I look at the Bible. You know, Jesus chose 12 men to be his followers, and, and I don't think it's fair we call Thomas doubting Thomas. He wasn't a doubter. He was a man with a mind who thought about things and looked at evidence and looked at facts and and, you know, Jesus chose him, which tells me Jesus is not offended by us asking hard questions and, and not just believing everything we're told. And I think that was the sort of guy Thomas was, and he was part of the team because Jesus needed him in his team. And so I love the fact that you came from a scientific background and looked at this whole area with really a, an analytical mind and, and your background um, in medicine. And Dr. Michael has been involved in the study of people who've had near-death experiences. There's a documentary film coming out very shortly called After Death, and it details the experiences of 14 people who died and came back to life, and their recollections of these near-death experiences or encounters with, with eternity have been documented and compiled into this movie. And what makes these stories even more interesting is that the 14 people are from different cultures and different parts of the world, and yet their stories are similar and have common themes. And if you want to ask Dr. Michael uh, a question about maybe an experience you've had or someone you know who's had an experience, you can call us on 1 800 316 316. That's 1 800 316 316. But Dr. Michael, just getting back to your experiences, did you have any interaction with the, uh, the 14 people who are featured in this documentary film? Did I have it? Uh, it oh, and the people that are in the film? Yeah. Uh, they were the, the people in the film were not my patients, except for one that, that was referred to, uh, Pam Reynolds, who actually her case is considered to be the most well documented and fascinating case worldwide. Okay, good. Uh, well, she, let's let's hear Pam's story. What what happened with Pam? All right, Pam is uh, was thirty five at the time. I'm I was in in Atlanta as a professor of medicine, and uh, Pam had a uh, cerebral aneurysm, which is a, uh, a bubble on the side of an artery that's about ready to break inside her brain. And if very delicate surgery to remove something like that, because the slightest little touch of that thing, it will open up and explode in her head and it's all over with. So they looked at her at Emory and did all the studies and said, thanks, but no thanks. We couldn't do this because of the location of the aneurysm and the size of it. So there was a place out in Arizona at the Barrow Neurological Institute where there was a Robert Spetzler who was uh, kind of innovating this new procedure called hypothermic cardiac arrest, okay. uh, nicknamed standstill. So we flew Pam out there and he uh, volunteered to go forward with the surgery. Uh, and make a long story short, uh, she came into the operating room, put under general anesthesia. Uh, her body temperature was lowered to uh, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very low. Uh, and she was all, everything was monitored, her EEG or EKG, obviously, her blood pressure. And they 
put her on a cardiopulmonary bypass machine, and Spetzler opened up her head while she was under anesthesia, obviously. And then when he was ready to excise the aneurysm, they, they cooled her body down through the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass machine, and everything stopped. Her brain waves stopped, her blood pressure zero, her heart stopped, uh, and this is the amazing part, and I'd never heard this before well, until. Well, let's stop that. Was she? Was that because her body was responding to the cold, and and she just like died, or was it because they were already starting to operate on the uh, the issue in her brain? Well, if you lower the uh, temperature of the heart to a certain level, it stops. Okay. Okay, it's hypothermic. So, and they injected some potassium too. I think that the make sure that, that it was totally stopped. The idea was to stop the heart entirely at the time. Uh, and usually when you do that, the per- the patient's on cardiopulmonary bypass. So if the heart stopped, the bypass machine takes over for the pumping of the blood into the brain, et cetera. But in this in- instance, what they wanted to do is drain the blood out of the head so that the aneurysm collapsed. So Spetzler could go in there pinch it off, tie it off, and get out. So what happened was that during this procedure, when she was, when blood was all out, what they did was when she was on the machine and she, her, blood, uh, her blood temperature was lowered to a certain degree, they raised the, the head of the operating room table, they turned the bypass machine off, and they drained all the blood out of her head like you drain oil out of a car. Yeah. And... Then he could go in there and, and uh, operate on, on the aneurysm. So you can't get much deader than that without actually not coming back. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, she had an experience during that time uh, that was around the time that this was all going on when she was under deep anesthesia. She had things kind of like what you got on your head there in each ear, so she couldn't hear what was being said. Yeah. She couldn't see because both eyes were taped shut yeah okay so she watched parts of this she described the equipment that was very unique that the saw the bone saw she said and this is interesting too she told me because i didn't know what this bone saw looked like the one that he cut her brain open or her skull open with and she said well it looked like i asked her and she said it looked like an electric toothbrush so and i recorded all these interviews yeah so uh I said uh, to myself, "Uh oh, we got a problem here. Uh, this is not this is not accurate because I can't believe that this thing's going to look like an electric toothbrush." Yeah. So I, I put her tape away. This is a little side story here. I put her tape away. Uh, tape away. This is called the file drawer effect. In other words, if you come across something you don't want to talk about, you just put it in the file drawer and forget it. Yeah. Okay. Well. I sort of did that for about a year while I was doing this study, but I had to go back to it. So I did. And the only way I know what this thing looked like, I found out where it was made in Dallas, Texas. I called uh, uh, Midas Rex is the name of the company. Uh, and they sent me a booklet with a picture of it and everything else. And, it, and it's in my book, Recollections of Death. The picture of the thing, it looks just like an electric toothbrush. Wow. Uh, it, it's amazing. So, and so anyway, she had she had no way of knowing that, did she? Uh, her eyes were taped shut. She had headphones on. Right. And I, I don't know about you, but I would be imagining like one of those old electric meat carvers, you know, your mum used to use oh, on, yeah, right. on your a Thanksgiving, our Christmas <laughs> lunch where you cut the roast. That's what I would imagine it to look like, not an electric toothbrush. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other interesting thing is, is that, when you're interviewing a patient, I mean, and this is this is getting into some kind of twilight zone stuff here. But when you're in, like you're interviewing me, you you can be transmitting information through your body or whatever uh, that the other person can pick up on. And I think some of this is, explains these cold readings that these mediums do. I mean, they can they get they get very sensitive to not just what you say, but how you look, et cetera, et cetera. So what's interesting here is that when I was interviewing Pam, she knew what it looked like and described it to me, but I wasn't telegraphing it to her because I didn't even know what it would look like. 
Yeah, amazing. Making it up. Okay. Yeah, amazing. So anyway, long story short, she did have the out of body experience, and then she had the tunnel experience, and uh, she met her mother or some deceased relatives and friends. That was probably during the part where she was most out of it, which was when the b- blood was out of her head. But I'm guessing that. That's the other thing. Oh, well, anyway, I'll finish. So they brought her back, warmed her up. And she told the uh, Dr. Carl Green, who was the associate surgeon with Spessler, the next morning when she was coming out of her anesthesia, what had happened to her. And he sort of like says, what? You know, and he didn't make a whole lot out of it. But in my next book, I, I interviewed Dr. Green. He's a very nice guy. And, and, and he filled in some spots there. So it wasn't like she woke up, talked to everybody in the hospital. They told her what, what happened. Yeah. And then she then reconstructed it from that. Knowledge. It's amazing. So she, she had an actual, out. she had an actual out of body experience. Now, Dr. Michael, I like the fact that you're from a scientific background and you went into this whole area quite cynically. And I think that's healthy. We've talked about that. So now let's look at this whole area quite cynically because a lot of people have these experiences, don't they, where they technically are dead and they need to be resuscitated. But let's talk about that. Do you believe these people actually die and enter eternity or what do you think is happening in these experiences they have? I I do not. I, I believe they're before death, not after death experiences. Thus the name near death experience. Uh, I think that dying is a process that leads up to the point of death. And I think that these experiences are happening during that process of dying. Uh, I also believe that it's the soul. And I've got in the book that I'm writing now, a couple of chapters on this by uh, Christian philosophers. JP Moreland is one in Los Angeles and Biola. Uh, But anyway, he believes very strongly that these are, representing the soul leaving the physical body. And I happen to agree with him. Uh, that would be a good explanation for why, why this, this entity, non-material entity, leaves the body as the, as the body physical body is dying and is able to maintain a sense of self, maintain consciousness, and actually observe things that can be shown to be accurate in the physical world. So to me, that that's, that's pretty good evidence that something that is going on there other than just making it up or hallucination. The real question is, does that entity then go and travel into the afterlife and, and see heaven, hell, uh, the streets of gold, etc., cetera, uh, and give what I would consider in many instances extra biblical knowledge of the afterlife of heaven and hell. And I'm not a proponent of that. And I, I state that up front. And that is controversial. And I know it also puts me into uh, contradiction with some other people here too. But I'm really glad you raised that point because we had a fairly well-known businessman in Australia many years ago. He owned one of our major TV networks. He was very well-known. His name was Kerry Packer. Now he had an accident. I think he fell off a horse. He was into polo and horses and, um, you know, and in that accident, he technically also died and he claimed there's nothing there because he wasn't aware of any experiences of any floating above his body. He was resuscitated by medical professionals and he used that as his reason to claim there was no God and there was no eternity because that that's all the experience. But what you're saying is that, yeah, when people are unconscious or in need of resuscitation, they're not fully dead, which means they haven't fully entered into eternity. Is that correct? That's correct. And the, defi- the definition of what you just described is what is called clinical death and not biological final death. And that's where the difference is. I believe near-death experiences occur during clinical death, not biological death. Biological death is permanent. You die once and then the judgment, he- Hebrews 9.27. Uh, God did raise seven people in the Bible, I believe, from death, and none of them reported a near-death experience. Uh, Paul went to the third heaven and saw things that he was not allowed to speak and came back and was actually given a thorn in the flesh 
in 2 Corinthians 12 to keep him from talking about it because that would then make him some feel like he really now knows something that nobody else does, etc. So these biblical references are, are all pointing to, like Lazarus uh, and, and then the rich man in Luke 16. Uh, what, what did Abraham tell uh, the rich man when he wanted to go back and, and report back to his family to tell them that he was in hell and afterlife is real? No, they have the law and the prophets. Uh, you cannot talk to or come back from death and describe what it's like. You've got the word of God, and you've got the Old and New Testament, and that is where the word of God is, and that's where we need to go. So Doctor, that, that I- is good preaching. I love that. And and I'm, I'm, so, I'm so glad you said that because I think a lot of Christians start to base their theology, don't they, on the experience of, of others who claim to go to heaven mm-hmm. and, and, you know, play golf with the saints or whatever they do up there or people who go down to hell and they, and they try and base their theology on these experiences. But I love how you frame that. We have to go back to the Word of God. The Word of God is our final authority, isn't it, on our understanding of life right. after death. Right. And the reason, one of the reasons why is because once you get in the spiritual realm, which I believe all of this happens, both before and after death, there's a spiritual realm, there's good and bad. And deception is one of Satan's biggest weapons. And so what you see is actually not necessarily what it actually is or what you get from it. So you, you can't, you can't do it on your own. You can see it. You can think it's this thing or that thing, but it can be totally different in reality. Yeah. And we won't really know all these answers, obviously, till we do get there ourselves one day. But at the present time, that's where I would like to leave it. Yeah, I really like that. And, and as you said, when we do get there, we ain't coming back to tell anyone about it. And and I really like the, the scripture you reminded us about that Paul probably did go to heaven, and it's certainly not a common thing, but he was not permitted to tell anyone about it. He was forbidden from relaying that information. In other words, like you said, it's the Word of God. It's the gospel that that the Lord has left for all of us to understand eternity. Now, Dr. Michael, we've got a couple of callers who are going to pose some... some, Sorry, yeah? One one second. I want to interrupt because I want to make this point. I think it's very important. There's another section to Paul's experience to the third heaven. It's before he got there. He was in the body or out of the body. I don't know. God knows. He says that twice for emphasis, which means that in a near-death experience, that's exactly the way they feel. They're out of their bodies. And uh, professors of theology, I've done research on this, have all agreed that when Paul says this, he is bringing up the possibility that the soul can leave the body prior to final physical death. So that would be what happens during a near-death experience. I uh, didn't mean to interrupt, but... No, that's really good, though. So so what you're saying is when people have these near-death experiences, they're probably starting on that process of death, and their soul is leaving their body, and that's part of the process, but it's not the end of the process, is it? It's not the final conclusion. It's not right. death. Right. Yeah, that's really, really well articulated and, and really well put, and it makes... A lot of sense. I think that didn't the Jews have a tradition or a belief that uh, a person had to be dead for three days before they would actually pronounce them dead because they didn't believe the soul left until after three days? Yes, they do. I'm not very familiar with their, but I do know in, in funerals, they wait three days, I think, before they bury the, the body because. They won't make sure. Yeah, but the uh, absolutely. I, I, I really don't know the theology of, of that, but I, that is my experience. Yeah, but I think it, it sounds to me like they probably acknowledge the same thing that the the first few minutes or even hours after someone passed away, the soul is in a process of journeying from this life to the next. But um, we do have a, a caller here who's called in. She's been very patiently waiting, and it's Anne who's calling us from a place called the Gold Coast in Australia here. Anne, welcome to the program. Oh, yeah, it's nice that I could listen to it. That's great. I read two books. One was a book I read. I don't know the book itself because it was about children and how um, they passed away and had their experience. 
And the other book I read, which I do remember, was 90 Minutes in Heaven, and where this guy, it's a true story, where this guy actually went to heaven and he described some parts of heaven. But in this book, he came back and he was so bitter and in pain and agony and everything for a long time until he realised that why he was back here and why he couldn't stay in heaven. And it was because he wanted to uh, help people to understand what heaven was all about. I don't know whether you ever read that book. Doctor, are you familiar with that particular book that she's mentioned there? Can you read? I, I couldn't quite hear what you were saying. That what, what 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 was the title of the book? Ninety minutes, minutes in heaven. Ninety minutes in heaven. In heaven, yeah. Have you come across yes, that one, Doctor? Actually, well, you're actually going to interview Don Piper, who wrote the book. Yep. Yeah. Aren't you? Okay. Uh, I do not believe Don Piper actually went to heaven. I don't think he died. And I make a very solid medical and biblical argument as such uh, in one of the last chapters of the book that I am writing. And that's where some of us part ways. Even I'm not questioning his Christianity. He's been a Baptist preacher. He's ordained. He's well-respected in his church. And he's a great guy, although I've never met him. I just heard stories about him. So I'm not questioning that. But this is, I think, an important point to make because when people, well, first of all, there are a lot of non-Christians who are going to places just like this in their near-death experience. And then what they come back to say is, well, I don't believe in Jesus, but I had an experience very similar to what you had. So what's the big deal here? I mean, it's it promotes universalism uh, in in a, in an indirect way. But so I, I think very there there does need to be a, a strong statement made that these are not after death experiences. And I know that Don Piper has written in one of his books. He starts his book off by saying. I died literally. I did not have a near-death experience. I had a death experience. The other thing is Hebrews 9.27 says, I, we are appointed once to die and then the judgment. Well, if he has already died once and he came back to talk about it like Paul was told not to do, then he, when he dies again, unless Jesus comes before then and he's raised and he doesn't die, yeah. uh, then uh, he, he dies two times. So again, it, it contradicts things in Scripture. And it's just not one verse. It's, it's a pattern of verses, which I think is the way to read Scripture. And uh, near-death experience is not part of the biblical message. Yeah, look, I, I love this about you. If you're just joining us, Dr. Di uh, Michael Sabome is a cardiologist. He's an author and a professor of medicine, but he's also a researcher who's interviewed over 100 people who've had near-death experiences, but he's also a very Bible-based Christian. And uh, we're talking about Scripture now and theology in the context of people's experiences. And I love what you just said then. You again reminded us of a, of a Bible verse that, you know, it's appointed to man to die once, not twice, but once. And then after that comes the judgment. And that is very sound theology uh, when we're looking at all these near-death experiences. But, you know, just hoping and praying, Anne, that books like that one that you read just inspire you and encourage you to want to read the Scriptures for yourself and search out and see what God says to put that sense of eternity in your heart. But, Anne, we do have another caller who's called in, but I want to thank you so much for, for calling in today. God, God bless you, Anne. Thank you so much. Now, we've got another call. We want to get through the calls today before we uh, we finish up. And we have Chris from Melbourne. Chris, welcome to the program. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, it's not a very good line. But anyway, I'll just say, uh, in the Bible, doesn't it say that, you know, Lazarus and the rich man, even if someone comes back from the dead, they won't believe them. Uh, but also, if anyone has an near-death experience uh, and they meet Jesus and he says, your time is not ready, he would uh, definitely say to them, because you are not put your trust in me. And if he sends them back, he would only tell them to go and tell the others that the only way to salvation is through my sacrifice on the cross. 
uh, that's the only way I would believe someone coming back, you know, from the near-death experience. Yeah, Dr. Michael, did you hear that? Uh, part of it. Um, uh, it it's, it's a difference between the quality of the audio birth and the accent of the speaker. <laughs> I, I understand Texan a lot better than I do Australian. Well, Dr. Michael, have you been out to Australia? Oh heavens no! Well, I think you That's need to <laughs> you need to put too that on to you need to put that on your bucket list, my friend, and you need to come out here All and right. visit down under. And uh, as Paul Hogan said many years ago on the TV commercial, we'll put a shrimp on the barbie just for you. But um, <laughs> so, so, so what our caller said is he also said what you said that you know the story of Lazarus and 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 the, the beggar and Abraham. When, um, you know, the rich man was in hell and he cried out to Abraham and he said, hey, can you send someone to, to warn my brothers about this horrible place? And Abraham said, as you said, doctor, that they have the law and the prophets. In other words, these, uh, these near-death experiences, uh, they can't supersede the word of God. They can't replace the word of God, that the salvation only comes through the gospel, not through people's experiences. And, and um, Chris, did you have another comment you wanted to make to the doctor today? I uh, know that that was it. Like yeah, mainly that uh, you know, if Jesus, if they did have any the experience, it, because like the devil is a counterfeiter, uh, maybe it's a, you know a experience from him. Whereas Jesus would definitely send you back and say that to to preach the gospel and that salvation only comes through him. Like John fourteen six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father and, uh, except through me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Amen. Amen. And doctor, so what? Uh, and Chris, I want to thank you for calling in today too, uh, calling in 2020. But Doctor, what uh, Chris just said is is basically reiterating that again, that if if someone did go to heaven and see Jesus, all Jesus would say is, well, go back and tell them what the word says. Go back and tell them I died for them. And it's my sacrifice on the cross that enables them to be saved. But the caller also said, Dr. Michael, that sometimes these experiences could even be counterfeit because the devil is a liar and he's a counterfeiter, and he's a you know he appears as an angel of light sometimes. And I want to ask you, Doctor, and Chris, thanks again for the call today. But Doctor, I want to ask you about you mentioned that even unbelievers claim to have experiences, which I assume you mean there's light and there's warmth and there's a sense of oh maybe this is heaven. Have you come across this in your individual study, the people you interviewed? Oh yes, absolutely, and I I believe that. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the theological term of general revelation of God and the special revelation of God. Yeah. The general revelation of God is the law of God is written on the hearts of all men and women, all across the board, across the, the universe. Okay. And so that law is on everybody's heart. And I think that reflects what, a lot of these after effects of these near-death experiences are. I mean, these people come back, uh, they believe in a higher consciousness or God or whatever they want to believe, but it is it is a higher being. Uh, they believe in life after death better and more, and they have a lot of after effects that are consistent with what the general revelation of God is that's written on their heart. Now, that is a not, not a salvation experience, but it is a general revelation of God experience. And it, I was one of the co-founders of the International Association of Near-Death Studies, which is the big organization now worldwide that involves research into the near-death experience. And there are a lot of my very close friends who are universalists, like there's more ways than one to God, and Christ is not the only way. And you've already quoted that uh, in your talk. So uh, we we're, we have a peaceful disagreement between between us on that that one issue. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's interesting though that even non Christians claim to see light and what they think is heaven, and it just confirms what you said earlier that yeah, when we first our heart stops beating and maybe we stop breathing for a minute or two. We're certainly on a journey towards death, aren't we? But that is not the final destination. Right, exactly. Yeah, I really love that about you, Doctor, that you were so Bible-based. We do um, have another call who's trying to call in now. We might take one more call. Is there any other final thoughts or, or messages you want to share with our audience today, Doctor? 
No, I've probably irritated enough people already. <laughs> well, I love the fact that you were so Bible-based. I love the fact that you've quoted so many scriptures because, you know, as I said and as you said, there's a danger in this topic that people can go after the experience at the expense of the Word of God. We cannot allow any experiences. And it's like uh, Paul said in Galatians, even if an angel appears to you and preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. In other words, it's the Word and it's the Word only. This is the basis of our faith. This is the substance of our salvation. Now, we do have one more call, and he's from a, a country area similar to Texas in a state called Queensland, uh, in Australia, and his name is Tim. Tim, thanks for joining the program today. G'day. What would you like to say today, Tim? Um, for many years, I had a friend who repeatedly told a story, um, and the, the fellow, he's passed away now, and I, I will say his name. His name was Ron Drury, and he... Um, he was a bit of a sort of a rough sort of a bloke and he ran into a tree and had a severe car accident. And he um, found himself in this beautiful place. And a voice said to him, you have to go, Ron, you have to go back. And Ron said, I don't want to go back. I like it here. And, and the voice said, if you don't go back, you'll never see my kingdom. And... Um, Anyway, that was really the turning point for him and gave his life to the Lord and and the rest is history. Yeah. So he so had that a, was his testimony. Yeah, amazing. So he had a near death experience. So doctor, I don't know if you picked that up or not, but this gentleman had a car crash and he heard a voice after the crash saying you need to go back. He obviously found himself in his body again and as a result of that experience, he turned his heart to the Lord, which is a great a great story and um Doctor, have you found other stories similar to this as well, that after people's near-death experiences, they also find a faith in Jesus? Absolutely. A absolutely. Uh, and I, in my second book, there's a, a case of Daryl Powell. He was a motorcycle druggie uh, who had a cardiac transplant. He had 10 cardiac arrests and three near-death experiences while waiting for his transplant. And he had a total conversion after that. And after that, he became a sold out 100%, gave his life to Christ and acted accordingly. So this can be a, a very uh, strong salvation experience for people. What I would say is with, with this general revelation of God, which I think the near-death experience is, there are many paths you can take out of it. And one of the big paths is the correct path to Christ. But you can't rely upon the general revelation to determine that. I mean, for instance, the one, the patient, or the, you know, he was a patient that I just referred to, he had been brought up in a Christian family. So he was a lapsed Christian. Yep. He, he had a Christian background. So what this experience did was reinforce what he had forgot when he was a kid. Yeah. So it, it it, it, it can be a salvation experience. It can be a, an experience to open your eyes to that the fact that there's a spiritual world out there. Yeah, well, God, God's a merciful God, isn't he? God's a merciful God, and he'll use any experience. He'll use every tool in the tool bag he can to bring us to his son Jesus. And so he'll even use these near-death experiences, won't he? Yes, Absolutely. Yeah, well, I just want to thank Tim for the call. Tim, we do have to move on in the show today. And I also want to really thank you, Dr. Michael. Dr. Michael Sabome is a cardiologist. He's an author. He's a professor of medicine, and he's a Texan. And he joined us today all the way from Houston, Texas, to share a little bit of his research that he's done over the years with people's near-death experiences. And it's all because there is a movie coming out in Australian cinemas shortly called After Death. That is After Death, and it's coming out on May 17th. It's going to be in the Hoyt Cinemas, in some of the event cinemas. If you want to find out more information about this movie, there's a website, and it's called movieschangepeople.com. That's movieschangepeople.com. It would be good to support this film. I know the filmmaker, the director, I spoke with him yesterday. His heart is that people will find greater hope and greater faith as a consequence of watching this documentary. But Dr. Michael Sabone, I really want to thank you for your time today. I thank you for your wisdom, 
your experiences. And I also just want to thank you and just say well done for being so Bible-based and so uh, focused on the Word of God above all else that we can experience in this life. Thank you. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.